Productive Pasture 24 with Mike Neglia. Hey friends, Chad's here. Welcome back to Productive Pasture. Do another one of the Pandemic Pasture episodes this week with my friend Mike Neglia. You might know Mike because I've talked about him on the show before. He's a longtime listener of the show, but he also runs a podcast called the Expositors Collective, which for everyone who likes a good sermon podcast, uh, you know, the kind of back end, how do you make the sausage type conversation about preaching, Mike's the guy to listen to. He's there. And I wanted to have Mike on for this Pandemic Pastor series because Mike leads a church in Ireland. And so the ways that he experienced, the way they had to deal with adaptation, the whole nine yards comes from this really, really different perspective than most of us in the States had to. So we're going to hear from Mike and learn from Mike today. But before we jump into that, just a couple of quick plugs that I'll always give these to you is this. Number one, we've been finishing up a fantastic email series on the Productive Pastor emails about the role of, of change and how do we lead change in a way that's honest uh, to what the Spirit is doing among us. So if you've not gotten those emails yet, you know, go over to the show notes, revchatbrooks.com slash ppp slash 024. Sign up for the email list. You can go back and you can find the archives there and you can be part of those series. So every month I kind of focus and drill down deeply on one of the, the core pillars of content I have here at Productive Pastor. The second thing is just invite you to come hang out with us in the Productive Pastor community. It's where all the cool kids, the fun kids are up called the Productivity Party. That's enough of this kind of front end stuff. Let's go straight into our conversation with Mike Neglia. Well, what's up, y'all? I'm here with Mike Neglia. I got him on the show now. I was on his show, The Expositors Collective, a couple a couple months back. Uh, you probably heard a quote that from him. That was part of the deal. That you was, told me you would only come No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, did I? That sounds like something I would do. <laughs> uh, I, if memory serves, you actually didn't, but I'm, oh, okay. I'm really glad to be here. Yeah, so I, I, I was on Mike's show, The Expositors Collective, which is a great, 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 great show. Um, it's one of my listen-tos every week. And also played a clip from that episode back in June, I think. And we talked about that. Um, it's been fun. I, Mike, I feel like me and you like did the email connect early this year or late last year. Yes. It was late last year. I remember exactly where I was. I, well, I sent you a random email just to be like, hey, I appreciate what you're doing. I'm glad you're coming back. That's that's cool. And then I was driving away from a wedding rehearsal, and I was at a stoplight, and I checked my email, at, which, you know, is not the best thing to do. Oh, no, but I was at do. the stoplight, and, and I was like – I was, I was alone in the car, but I was like, <gasps> Chad Brooks emailed me back. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that he likes my show. <laughs> uh, you know, so, uh, it makes me think about this. Uh, I'm excited. I, I'm very excited that you're that excited. You remember that old movie, yeah. That Thing You Do with Tom Hanks? About the one-hit wonder band? Is that where he pretend? Does he pretend to be a pilot? No. So no, no I don't. Okay. I don't think so I remember. So it's like a, it's like a, 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 it's a story about some like band in the mid sixties during Beatlemania. That's a one hit wonder. But in the beginning of the movie, they're playing at this pizza parlor and they have a fan. And when I got that yeah. email from me, he's like, Oh, that's my fan. <laughs> that's my guy. <laughs> yeah. How's it feel to be a C list celebrity? I know. Oh uh, man. Yeah. I, 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 well, okay. So, if I could, yeah, I, I am a fan. I, I said this to you before, but like I've been listening to Productive Pastor. It, I think it may have been the very first podcast I ever subscribed to ever. Um, so in the in the first run and I've listened to not all, but most of, of the episodes. And um, yeah, to, to talk to you is cool. But I also right now feel a whole, huge wave of like, um, what's the word? Um imposter syndrome like the thoughts that there's going to be an episode that comes out and it's going to have the words productive pastor and then mike neglia in the same title because because i'm not very i'm not very productive and i've been like i think the reason why i was drawn towards towards your show when i first came across it was like that's what i need i need to grow and like the ability to to do things well and to get things done and to have this focus and uh, in, in both iterations, in the earlier version of the show and the, the current one, like I really am 
trying really hard to grow in these areas because they don't come naturally to me. So yeah. yeah, I don't think anyone would ever describe me as like a productive pastor. And so I just want to say at the front end, I am working towards it. I hope to be productive in some way, in some day. Well, I, I hope to be productive one day too. <laughs> I always, my, my, my wife always laughs, really funny story. Uh, she, she'll, uh, when I'm just kind of slacking around, she's like, all right, productive pastor, come on. Mm, mm, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I always just say, I'm, I'm, I'm just the head of the people trying to figure this out. But uh, when I was making my list for this, like, pandemic pastor series, you know, Mike was one of the first ones on because of a couple of different things. Uh, a, it was an excuse to have him on the show because the Expositors Collection is one of my favorite listens. But B, you know, I was trying to get a, a diverse of a – of a cross section of pastors of just like normal churches I could. And Mike jumped out because Mike is doing something that, you know, I, I don't know anybody else who's doing mm-hmm. that. And so we'll just kind of jump into this and, and get sure. going. But Mike, like, you know, let's talk about your ministry context and, you know, your pastor and what the community looks like. Sure. Well, I guess first, like I have a California accent. I was born and raised in California, uh, but 19 years ago, I moved to Ireland and I've lived in Ireland ever since. So I, um, my, my, my wife and I were both from California. We we're high school sweethearts and I moved over here first and uh, then went back to California for a couple months, got married. And then we, we lived our whole married life together in, in Ireland for just shy of 20 years now. And so that's kind of the context. I guess that's how what's what's different about me and so everyone else that you know. I'm not going to make assumptions, but you're pushing as much time in Ireland as you probably lived in the States by now, aren't you? I, yeah. I, I, I'm 39 and I moved here when I was 20. So I've been here. Yeah. I'll have to do the math, but the time, the time is going to come very soon when I've lived longer in Europe or long, longer in Ireland than I've lived in America. Yeah. Okay. That's good. And my accent is just as plain Jane, vanilla, California, as it was when I got here. I, I would love if I could actually pick up the accent, but it's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. So talk to us about your church and your community, the place that you lead. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, part of a church called Calvary Cork, uh, we're part of the Calvary Chapel family of churches, um, Calvary global network, et cetera. Um, our church is, you know, after, after 19 years, I could say our church is like 200 adults, you know, um, we are not a, a mega church. Um, that being said, we are, I, I believe like the second biggest Protestant church in our, in our city, which is, uh, you know, quarter million people, um, or second biggest, you know, evangelical church like i don't use the word protestant very much here because protestant protestant in ireland is too evangelical in in modern america yeah where it, it, it's a it's a theological term yet it has political connotations to it so um i don't use the word protestant here because it means something else it means like uh, you know allied with the british and it, it's, there's a whole complicated yeah, if, 800 if, year backstory about why i don't use that word here but i will use it with you yeah yeah so yeah so we are yeah a, a very big church by irish evangelical or Irish Protestant standards uh, to use that, but, you know, rather average by uh, U.S. U.S. terms. Uh, we have, you know, two full-time staff, me and our, our youth guy, and then a whole bunch of, of volunteers that help run things. Yeah. So right, so right there, you have a very, very different, and I think that that's kind of lead into some of these more pandemic questions, because I know me and you yeah. talked about this earlier, but um, like, when did you start realizing that you that y'all might have to make some decisions about the coronavirus? I was uh, earlier in March. I was in. <clears throat> well, I, I I used to travel a lot. <laughs> I was in I was in Portland like in February, and then we were hearing about this thing, and then ended up doing like a, a expositors collective training event in Budapest early March, and then just seeing all these people in masks in in airports. And then hearing these things, um, a friend of mine is a missionary church planter in Bahrain, uh, the kingdom of Bahrain in the Middle East. And they got shut down like a week or two before 
uh, the rest of the, the rest of the Western or European world. And so that was this thought of like, wow, this, this could be, this could be a big deal. And then in March, I think a little bit bef- like a, about a week or so before the U S yeah. uh, we got, you know, these, we did, we, and the U S is what stay at home mandates yeah. um, or sh- shelter in place. Yeah. Uh, they just called it lockdown here. Um, even though that word was like, they tried to avoid that, but yeah. So in, in March, uh, it kind of was the culmination of these rumblings that I've seen across like, you know, Eastern Europe and then, yeah, you know, the far or the middle East with my friend there. So I've been hearing about it for a long time. Then all of a sudden, oh, this is happening here. And I was at I was at Lennox's Chipper, and I was ordering fish and chips for my family. And they had a, a TV. Fun fact: that was the first color television that ever existed in Cork. It was in this, um, in this chip uh, fish and chip shop. And so the, the you know it's they, they've been around for a long time. And a lot of my friends or neighbors talk about they used to specifically get there just so they could watch TV in color. And then I was there getting fish and chips, and then I watched the the uh, the Taoiseach, uh, the Prime Minister, uh, say that you know we we're going to shut down for two weeks to flatten the curve. And so I was getting my fish and chips being like, this is a big deal. Yeah. So what, what were those first few weeks like for y'all in the church as y'all were like making decisions and that sort of thing? Like, like, like what were those? I call those the fun weeks. <laughs> oh, they were fun. Oh, that's um, for anybody who likes innovation fun. or adaptability. Like yeah. that was exciting. And then after a while you're like, oh, this is permanent. Like what, what were those first sure. few weeks like for y'all in, in the decision-making process and in adaptability? Okay. We, we, um, the decision, I guess, to, to close down was, was very easy for us for, for two different reasons. Number one, we meet at a school. And so the, the facilities wouldn't have been open to us, um, even if we wanted to. So, you know, it's a school owned by the government. And so that was closed off instantly to us. Um, that's, that's the, obvious one. The second one is Irish culture. Um, the, the cultural values, um, are, you know, very strong here of like a community oriented and what's good for the, what's good for the, the masses. Um, the, the obligation to the rest of society is bigger than personal preference. And that actually is a, is a very deep core value of, of, you know, secular and religious Ireland. And so the, the notion when we're being told this is good for other people, it, it was very, very easy to, of course, of course, we'll sacrifice for the good of, of the society around us and our neighbors and the, the grandmothers and all of those things that, that were being, you know, said around the world, but it deeply resonated with Irish psyche. And so it was no problem at all to inconvenience ourselves for the sake of others. So like right there is one of the reasons I know I want to talk with you about we'll talk with you on yeah. this is, you know, and it might go, it's, it was a, it wasn't a long, long episode of, uh, I think of this cultural moment with Mark Sayers and John okay. Mark Comer, they talked about the three buckets, the idea that, did you ever hear this conversation? I've listened to most of those episodes. I don't know if I can, I'm not tracking with you. So, I'm sorry. Every reference you have, whether it's <laughs> catch me if you can't or whatever film or keep trying with cultural references. I'll, I'll get them eventually. I, just, I spend too much time on other things, I guess. Um, uh, but one they said they talked about but was. Listen, I, kn- I know who Tom Hanks is and I've listened to that podcast, <laughs> but I don't. We're halfway that there. episode doesn't sound familiar yet. Well, they and, and Sayers talked about how there's like these three buckets and one of the buckets I always forget what it is. The other bucket is, you know, like corporate responsibility. And then the mm-hmm. other bucket is freedom. And he's talking mm. about equalized societies. And, uh, you know, like he's talking about, you know, in North Korea, that corporate responsibility bucket is overflowing, but there's no, there's no water in their freedom bucket. And, and this was in like 2018, 2019. So this is not COVID era whatsoever at all. He said, you know, in, in the West, especially in America, that freedom bucket is overflowing and you're, you have a drought in your corporate responsibility. So yeah. like, like what you said right there is like one of those pinpoints that is uniquely different that y'all never, y- y'all never had to navigate like the deep controversy of that initial lockdown. Yes. But y'all yeah. stayed locked down for a really long time. That's that's right. That's right too. Yeah. Like thinking, thinking back on it. And then as I'm trying to, you know, think in advance about this conversation or the types of things that you might ask or, uh, you know, 
and I'm not even going to say, and and Mark Sayers and probably like, I'm not even saying what bucket should be the most full. And I don't think he's even saying, and, and it's wrong to have water in this or that. It's, it's just kind of, as you travel or as we live in this connected world, you just see people actually do think and feel and value things differently. And, uh, you know, Christianity and the gospel speaks to all of those things. But um, anyway, so what I said earlier on about like how Ireland has this like deep, rooted commitment to community or corporate responsibility to use that that language um yeah there's strengths to that and there's weaknesses to that too and i've lived here long enough for like i can see i can see both i can see the strengths and weaknesses to this um communal and corporate uh focus it unlocks some great some great wonderful things and then also has like a shadow side yeah but it also made pastoring a lot easier <laughs> for certain aspects. There are, there are things because, you know, I'm on the internet, same as you. Um, I, I grew up in the States and I'm part of a network that, you know, is not exclusively in the U S but a lot of our uh, leaders will be based in the U S. So I had seen not just not in March, you know, but it, as the months dragged on, as it, it came into that summer. And then as there was a big move to reopen the churches, and I think there was a date that somebody set Pentecost Sunday, I think. Yeah. Um, it was like, let's have 20,000 churches reopen on Pentecost and, and, and then seeing, you know, my, my friends and my peers having to navigate whether to do that. And when there's like vocal movements within the church saying we have to do this pastor and then others saying, don't you dare. And I, I, I saw all that. I prayed with some of my friends at this kind of monthly zoom prayer meeting with other, you know, pastor friends of mine and they're going through it like in a real politicized way. And I guess the gift that I had is that I didn't have a single conversation about when we should reopen or when we shouldn't. It was just such a a moot point, which is, well, of course we won't. And not one person for the first like 12 months even suggested that maybe we should find some other way of gathering. And so that's a unique, I don't know. Blessing, perhaps. It just it, it definitely it's made things just plain old easier yeah. uh, to do. There was no division amongst the church about it. It was just, and this is maybe someone would say groupthink, but this is just like, well, of course we won't. Why would we even, you know, why would we even entertain that idea? The government says not to, so of course we won't. Yeah. So, so how long? And I remember I asked you this when we were talking a couple months ago. How long did y'all not meet for corporate worship? You know what? I I have it written right here to look that up. <laughs> um, I don't know because it's COVID time too. It felt like forever. All, all I know is that it was um, we we began. Uh, I mean, maybe we could pause and I could go look it up in a calendar, or I, I could just say that we had such a long time where it was exclusively on YouTube Live. You know, yeah, Calvary. You know, YouTube.com slash. Calvary Cork. Um, that was our, that was our home address for, for so long. And there was a time when the guidelines allowed like gatherings of, I think 50 people or I think it was 20 the first. Yeah. So they, they'd allowed these staggered groups to, to gather together. And so we met back in the, the high school gym and with like 20 people, we'd live stream from there and then it got increased to 50 and then there'd be you know these statements from above saying actually no more gatherings anymore so then we go back to exclusively online so we didn't even have kind of uh i don't know the day when it was over it was we had this kind of piecemeal it was like 20 people on a sunday 50 people on a sunday zero back to youtube uh so it was back and forth it was a very, very, very long time. That's all I could tell you. Look, I know earlier you said you said twelve months, so it was at least a year. I, I think longer than twelve months. Yeah, yeah. So with, with a few with a few of those little breaks in between, where yeah. it was like twenty or fifty, and then it would be back to exclusively online. So that's I think that you're unless some unless my calculations are wrong, I think that you are going to win the award for the pandemic pastor series of the longest amount of like <laughs> no physical worship. Um. I mean, how, what type of adaptations did y'all have to make at Calvary Cork to 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 be with people and to be to be doing church things? Also, knowing that you're in a super different context, so there's I think the the programmatic building open every day 
uh, keep the kids, you know, out of playing in the road type ministry that we do. Some of us, so many of us do here in the States. Like, like what were those big adaptations that y'all had to make over the course of that year? Yeah. Big adaptations. I mean, like on the one hand, probably similar to what other people doing, you know, kind of phone call campaigns, um, you know, being very, very deliberate to make sure that not just the prominent people were being looked after, but <clears throat> like, we don't have a formalized membership yet. We're, we're working on it. We want to have that. But, and because of that, sometimes it just involved like going through our social media and seeing like, well, who are the people that follow us? And then it's kind of like, wait, does that person come here or not? That kind of kind of shows the the disadvantages of a, of a lack of formal leadership, sorry, formal membership where it's like, well, who, who are our people? And, and, you know, this person that comes every couple of months, like, do they go to another church or are we the only church that they go to? But so, yeah, trying to have those contacts. And then I guess also with the kind of going back to the, maybe the, the Irish lockdown and its, its regulations, like we had the most severe and the longest lockdown. And then in those early days, it was like, you had like a two kilometer limit to your house that you were allowed to go. And then it was expanded to like five and then 10. But we're, we, we live in the city, the city center. And um, a couple of nights there would be actually like police checkpoints outside of our doors. <laughs> um, like we just lived in, in a part where the street was kind of wide. And so like, there'd be like, you know, they're called guardy, these outdoor gatherings and, and that kind of thing. And it was just sadly not, not an option for a year. And there'd also be very little interest in doing such a thing, at least for the first 12 months. Yeah. Um, what's your question? Sorry. Did that, well, did no, that get no. to that point? Or? Well, let me just like to add it because that's the thing is I know, I, I don't know how much I told you this. I lived in Amsterdam for a summer doing mission work. Oh, in like I didn't know 2002. that. 2002. So hey. it was in the long, long ago, but I, I remember. It's like when you talk about how Calvary Cork is the second largest Protestant church in the community, in the town, like, yeah, that makes sense. I remember going to churches in Amsterdam and there's like 15 people and that sort of thing. Right. Uh, that, that European, especially that center, that city center European idea is, is, is there. Um, let me ask you this is, is the kind of like amorphous membership process or idea? Is that a, like a Calvary chapel thing? Is that a European thing or is that just a Calvary cork thing? What a great question. Uh, kind of, kind of both um, Calvary chapel, is not usually that big on formalized membership. Um, it's something that that I see the value in. And a couple of years ago, we had kind of a kind of a campaign or kind of just this ongoing conversation that I kept bringing before just the elders and then even even some key leaders about bringing in formal membership. And uh, yeah, it was it was a whole lot of pushback that it was formalizing something that should be organic and kind of community oriented. Yeah. Um, which maybe comes back to some of those, those, those core values of, um, you know, we don't need to sign a paper or pledge to be part of this community. We, we are a part of the community. So you're maybe hearing some of my frust- frustrations of like, I think that we should have this by now. And then for me, the, pandemic or the lockdown only proved the the necessity of it. Yeah. And other people with different perspectives might even look at that same data and, and say, I don't know, this proves that they aren't necessary in, in the first place. Yeah. But yeah. It's kind of a Calvary, Calvary chapel worldwide thing. I think it's uniquely on uh, maybe European or Irish uh, reluctance towards it, but you know, we're, we're doing it come September. We're going to launch kind of an official uh, membership campaign. Yeah. And uh, I'll get back to you. To let you know if that works or not. <laughs> well, it's like that kind of goes into like the, the, the biggest question is like, um, and this is, this is the question I think everybody kind of either likes or does not like, but like, like what, what leadership or what decision regrets do you have? So many, let me check the time. All right, we're good. <laughs> um, I got, yeah. Okay. Um, I have, I have, okay. I have some, some leadership regrets and then I have some, some personal regrets. So I'll, I'll start with leadership and then, and then move towards kind of, kind of personal. Um, I guess, honestly, when I think back, the, the biggest regret that I had was, um, I think expecting or, or, or yeah, expecting more out of like our video people than they were able actually able to do. And 
uh, you know, again, remember those early days in March or as, as things were kind of settling down, I was like the biggest like church tourist, you know, yeah. as I was like watching everyone's videos and be like, well, how are they doing it? Or, or then sometimes like, well, what's pastor so-and-so, what does his living room look like? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then, and then seeing some of the more creative ones, you know, the, the ones that are almost like a, like a vlog, you know, yeah. and then I'd seen those things and, and then being like, I want to do that. And, uh, you know, talking to our various people that did various aspects of like our AV stuff. I mean, like, Hey, what if we went to our baptism spot and I could film there or this or that. And a lot of times people would say, you know, yeah, we'll try. And it was very easy for me to ask. And then it turned into like a very big project for them and, you know, very hard. And like I said, at the very beginning, we only have two staff people and that's me and the youth guy. AV is not staff. And so they took on a lot of things because, I asked for it and then they said, sure, we'll try. And then it ended up being this big thing where I think, you know, for us as a, as a relatively, as a, as a small church, trying to have the higher value of what the bigger churches were doing. And then in so doing, that was kind of a, it was a frustrating thing. It was a learning experience, had to deliberately kind of dial it back. And uh, yeah, I guess realizing the the role as as pastor or you know leader amongst this team it, it it's very easy for me to ask something and then people because of their good hearts will try to make it happen and realizing that maybe i should have had a bit more like discernment or filter about like even what it is that i'm that i'm asking everyone there's so much pressure and you know if if mike wants to you know, have a transition and he wants to snap his finger and then appear in a different location to make the YouTube video more, more interesting. Um, it's very easy for me to ask. And then it's very hard for somebody to figure it out. So it was, I guess it could come down to the idea of like learning other people's limits and trying to operate within that particularly or trebly so with, with volunteers. That's kind of, uh, my first regret. And then the second regret when it comes to leadership is, um, I guess not enough checking in on leaders um, as individuals during, during some of those times, or especially as kind of like, as it just kind of grinded on, there'd be certain like vulnerable, vulnerable people within the church that would get a lot of attention. I remember, you know, like walking down to to a house, a person down the road, um, she goes to the church and like talking to her on the phone and looking at her through the window and like putting my hand on the window and and then like we, you know, pray together. And like, so certain people got a whole lot of care. And then the people who got the least amount of care was kind of core elders and trustees, you know, the kind of like, hey, listen, we'll solve problems together. And the problems are the vulnerable people in the church. So let's look after them together. And I wish that I would have beyond just saying, you know, you're okay. All right, good. You still tested negative. Great. All right. Anyway, let's, let's talk about fixing problems. Yeah. Realizing that like, you know, I'm a leader with a bunch of problems and other leaders have a bunch of problems too. And kind of rushing through that and assuming that we're all okay when there are people who deserve pastoral care instead of just, helping me to give pastoral care to, to others. Those are kind of my, my two, two regrets when I think about that long draining uh, time. Yeah. So like, what do you feel like y'all learned and you took from, from that season that was super important for your church and it's setting the tone for who y'all are now? Yeah. I mean, it, it really has come down to like checking in on, leaders as people instead of totally you know just assuming that we're fellow mission it's it's both we're fellow in the one sense like we're we're on mission from jesus together and we gotta reach this city and care for these people and you know x y and z and also though i'm their pastor and if i'm not kind of checking in on them pastorally most people probably you know probably nobody is. And so kind of realizing that it's not just, it's not just all hands on deck. It's that like the helpers need helping and the people that are caring need to be cared for. And yeah. yeah, And that's, and that's me, you know, that that's, that's on me. Um, Not exclusively, but it it should be coming from me and it shouldn't only be, Hey, Mike's calling so that we can plan how we're going to help somebody. But sometimes, Hey, Mike's calling and he just wants to know how I'm doing. 
Yeah. And that's something that has been a shift. I need to do more of that, but that's something that has been uh, a strong shift with incremental growth ever since then. I, I never wanted to stop. Yeah. I've heard, I've talked to a lot of folks that, that learned, like, did, did y'all, did you plant Calvary Cork? I replanted it. It okay. was, yeah, I, it technically no, but, but actually, yes. Yeah. So like, I've talked to a lot of leaders that are that driven in a way that they can make things happen. You know, the church planning types, that sort of a thing. And almost every single person I talk to me included that has those kind of persuasions one of the biggest lessons they learned during COVID was taking care of their leaders. Whether they learned that lesson the hard way or the easy way was, okay, there's that moment of why are they calling me right now? It is always to ask me something. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to get too much into it or, or even like divulge stories, you know, um, not not for my protection, but for the, just the involvement of these other people. But yeah, that's something where I, I just became the guy who asked things to help others. Um, and I, I essentially, we're big on like, you know, at Calvary Cork anyway, we're big on like plurality of elders. You know, I'm like first among equals. But then to also be like, okay, yes, we're first among equals. But also I am their pastor and I want to I want to be caring for them as well. So that's that's been a learning yeah. experience for me. So like what... um. I feel like some of these questions that that we have, a lot of them would kind of come back into the same thing. But like, if if you've got one lesson that you think could help other church leaders that y'all learned, like, what would it be? Ah, uh, I'm well. I mean, I guess I think I just said it. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, care, and, and that's again. I think I, I appreciate what you said, Chad, about how maybe that is more of kind of a a church planter type problem or, you know, a cross cultural, you know, somebody who moves from one side of the world to the other, like I wouldn't have done that if I didn't really believe like God's called me to, to do something and to plant something and to make this long-term impact. And, and I'm willing, I suppose, and, and myself and my family have made like a lot of sacrifices to, to do so. And not everybody is wired that way. And then, and that's okay. Like, yeah. that's okay. I'm a weirdo. I'm an outlier and I'm, and I'm not better or worse. I, I just have a certain vocation that is like statistically rare. You know, yeah. most people aren't weirdos like me. And so that's kind of something that I've, that, that I have learned that there is something like, remember, okay. Early back in, back in March or, or, What's the month after March? April. April. Um, you know, there was this kind of meme or there was this kind of like trope online that it was um, essentially just people being like, what do I do with all of this free time? You know, or people talking about like, now that I have all this free time, I'm, I'm doing this or that. And I saw somebody respond to it and it really resonated with me. And it was like, what free time? <laughs> you know, like what this is, it's, it's, 10 times busier and more hectic than it ever was before. And that really resonated. If I want to use that phrase, it was like, yeah, like maybe, maybe, you know, if you're an employee of another company and all of a sudden you have time off, that's something different. But if you're spinning all the plates, if you're the one that's checking in, it's like, I found, and it wasn't until, and I remember this, it wasn't until like mid May that I watched anything on netflix and um you know i i skipped tiger king like i didn't (laughs) for me it was just like it was like all all hands on deck this is the end of the world you know i'm a dispensationalist man so (laughs) oh man yo i'm sure you're you were worried (laughs) uh, yeah but like i i was just like i was it was just pedal to the metal um like people are going to die. Everyone's going to die. You know, I was doing the math and thinking what, what percentage of my pop of my church is going to die. How many, you know, dead bodies in the streets are we going to see? It didn't turn out yeah. as it was kind of promised, but in those beginning, I was just like reading everything, total panic. Um, you know, um, we had, I got it from the, the gospel coalition. They had amongst all the other stuff, they had this little like printed out leaflet and, 
you know, I, I, I printed it out and you could customize it. And it was like, you know, hi, my name is so-and-so. I am one of your neighbors. I'm part of this church. If you need help with anything, I uh, remember you that. Know, yeah. 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 So I, I went hard on that. I went harder than, than anyone on that. Cause I was like panic stations. Let's, let's do this. Let's yeah. get these last people saved before the world ends. Um, and I like encouraged people in my church to, to do this. And we, we made photocopies and templates and, uh, but then ultimately it was like me and like two other people that did it. And I did it like all day, every day, just kind of like going up and down. I had like latex gloves and I was, you know, carefully putting that in the, in the thing and, and just kind of realizing like, this is so serious. Somebody has to do something. Why aren't more people feeling the severity of this? And so, but again, looking back, realizing it's cause I'm a weirdo. It's cause I'm an outlier. It's because like I'm geared in this sort of way that gets certain things done. Yeah. And there was times when I was honestly frustrated um, that more people in the church weren't feeling the severity of this. And um, yeah, in fact, actually um, I have, I have this little scar on my hand. This is wonderful for audio podcasts, right? <laughs> As I point to the scar on my hand and it's from, it's from like a, a gate shutting on my hand as I was, you know, um, passing out, shoving these things between people's, um, into people's mailboxes and a gate closed on my hand and I was wearing like the latex gloves, you know? And so it like kind of crushed my hand and like, it was all like full of blood and I didn't want to take it off because like, Oh, I might contaminate somebody. And so it healed all weird from that. And that's kind of, for me, it's still, it's still there. Maybe it'll be there for the rest of my life as kind of this somewhat humorous reminder of like how scared I was or how like driven I was to really do this last final push before the world ends. Yeah. And uh, yeah. So what have I learned? I don't know. Chill out. The world doesn't yeah. get end. <laughs> or, or yeah, maybe it's good. Maybe, you know, I have the calling or the makeup to do that sort of thing, but not everybody does. And that's okay. Yeah. I had a friend of mine, I kind of, you, you go back to that. He, he called me and uh, this, this friend normally, will call very randomly at random times and say random things and then hang up. And then that's his signal for, Hey, call me back. I want to have a real conversation. And he called okay. me in like late April around that time and said, I thought there'd be zombies and hung up. Mm-hmm. And that was it, <laughs> I, cause I remember just like that. I, 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 yeah, I had a little bit of that. Um, I had that in 2008 when the market crashed. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's, a, there's a very, very long story about Chad in the book of revelation that uh, part of the story is when the market crashed in 2008, I was flipping out. Really? But um, really? like I know like you, you've got a hard deadline, and I also ah, know that the ooh, last yeah. two questions you wanted to, 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 to not do. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to throw a question at you to be our last question. Okay. And it's, it's kind of, it pulls, it pulls us into 2022. And it's more of your mission field and less pandemic. But, you know, you have served in a place now for, over, for almost two decades that, is fairly ambivalent to the church. And many folks in America, in just in the last few months, have begun to fully realize, even in the Deep South and the Bible Belt where I am, that the average person just does not. They're ambivalent mm-hmm. to the church. Yeah. Give us, give us three minutes from your perspective as someone who's done this for, for almost 20 years now, like what does it mean to lead a church when the community around you is ambivalent? Well, Jesus said that, or actually, or is it John? Maybe you can edit this out. The Bible says you will know that we're Christians by the love that we have for each other. Um, just, just yesterday, I, you know, I have this, um, this monthly open invite to the local pub that serve that they do like a, a deal on chicken wings, you know, and I don't particularly even like chicken wings that much, but it's this great open invite that anyone from the church is able to come along and we just hang out for two hours and, um, been doing it for a long time. And then last, last night, Liam, Liam O'Sullivan guy from the church, he brought along a friend from work, uh, for the first time. And, and it's not a specifically evangelistic thing or anything, but I was 
uh, following up with Liam, even just a couple hours ago to say like, thank you so much for like trusting us with your friend. Uh, because a lot of times it's, it's a, it really is an act of trust to to bring your work, but your non-Christian work buddy to any kind of church event. Cause you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, you know? absolutely. Yeah. Mike could be talking about being a dispensationalist or something, you know, <laughs> something weird could take place. Um, and I was like, thank you for trusting us that you would bring him to, to eat chicken wings uh, with us. And, and Liam was just saying that like um, that, that he thought it would be good to see for him to see like guys, caring about each other not putting each other down like having this like open just friendly conversation and he's like that's kind of a rare thing and i wanted my my friends from work to experience that and uh, he said as they as they drove drove home um his friend was like you know appreciative he didn't fall on the knee uh, fall on his knees and get converted on the spots but that was the sort of thing where it was like we're maybe that's a microcosm of what I want our, our whole church to be, to be something that is so different and so like, yeah, welcoming and, and, and even loving each other in such a way that people can trust us to bring other people into that community. They could say this actually, it actually is good and it's actually better off for you. And it's not just heaven when you die one day, but it's like, it's life here together is, is better. And I want my friends to get in on this. So counter counter intuitively, um, I think we can reach the world by like by caring for each other in such a way that creates that attractional um, gravitational pull um, that I saw, you know, in a microcosm just last night over chicken wings and beer. But that was a that was something that I would love for our whole church to continue being. Yeah. Oddly enough, and I'll close with this because be, me being nerdy and read too much, what you pretty much just said was the entire thesis of Alan Creeder's The Patient Ferment of the Early Church. I know. That's why I said it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it's just like, no, it's a community that really. life is made better with these people. And so I'm willing to make whatever decisions and sacrifices because the life I experience with these people is safer, is better, and I'm more well cared for than I am outside of it. And so... um as we are in the middle of of uh, of crazy chaos, how funny is the church already knows this is yeah. in our DNA. It's what we do. So, Mike, thanks for being part of Productive Pastor, the Pandemic Pastor series, and we'll, we'll we, we we I need to get you to come back on and talk to talk about preaching and all the things you've learned interviewing hundreds of preachers over the last few years. So. I have a lot of opinions about preaching, and I'd love to share some of them with you. <laughs> oh, well, y'all, make sure to go check out Mike's podcast, The Expositors Collective. It's like I said, one of my, my favorite listens each week. Mike, thanks again. It's a real joy. I'm actually off to interview Angie Thornton uh, next about training women's ministry directors in French-speaking Canada. So that's the episode I'm off to do right now. Oh, awesome. The constant thread that I am hearing across almost all of these conversations is how people learned about the value of relationships, of kind of old school ministry, what that looked like. While we were in the middle of those first moments of the pandemic, I felt like so many of us were thinking about the technological innovation that was happening, the churches that never did live streaming, all of that sort of things, the idea of online discipleship, all of that. But what I'm, I've am i heard from everybody, what I've learned from everybody, and honestly, when I go back and process on my own experience and, and th- thoughts and all the things, I feel like the average size church learned so much about the value of relationships. And I love what Mike had to say about c- taking care of his leaders in those moments just so much gold, so much to learn from here in this episode. So come back into the Productive Pastor community on Facebook. Uh, Let folks know what's going on. Mike is actually in there. He's a member of the community. He comments and stuff from time to time. So you can totally throw whatever questions you have at Mike in that realm. But Pandemic Pastor, let me know what you think about this. Next week, we're going to go off track and we're going to do an episode about why 80% matters. So we're going to get off the Pandemic Pastor train for a little while. We can come back on to it. We've got some plans to come back on to it, but that's what we're going to be doing next episode. But until then, I'm Chad. You know, Hosting this community, being part of this is just truly one of the joys of my life. 
I'd love to have you come hang out with us on the community. You know, share these links. Let these. Let's, if if this is affecting you, if you're learning from the podcast, the best way to make this community grow and we grow because we all get better together is just to share these links with your friends. Let the folks know you're learning from this sort of thing. So, I'll be back next episode. Until then, y'all just just stay productive. <laughs>